All right, so uh, I'm going to start with our last introduction. Okay, so uh, well, we are back. Uh, our last uh, speaker is uh, Professor Sanjeev Das, uh, who we have known here at Eisenberg for, for many, many years. Uh, when he was at Harvard, he came here and presented a couple of times at our conference. Uh, he is uh, William and Janice Terry Professor of Finance uh, and Data Science at Santa Clara University's Levy School of Business and an Amazon Scholar at AWS. He previously held faculty appointments as Professor at Harvard, as I mentioned, and UC Berkeley. He holds post degree, uh, degrees from, in finance from NYU and also uh, degrees from UC Berkeley and the uh, Indian Institute of Management. Uh, and of course, we just found out that he and I started as undergraduate in accounting. Uh, <laughs> he's a senior editor of Journal of Investment Management and associate editor of Management Science and other academic journal, and also is on the advisory board of the Journal of Financial Data Science. Uh, we just heard from its senior editor, Joe Simonian. Prior to working uh, as an academic, he worked in the derivatives business in Asia Pacific region as a vice president at Citibank. His current research interests include portfolio theory, wealth management, machine learning, financial networks, derivative pricing, and modeling of default risk, systemic risk, and venture capital. Uh, we were just talking about it, but for uh, for the recording, I should mention that he has a terrific book, and he tells me he's got actually just quite a few of them that are not on his website. Uh, but the one on uh, data science that he has that uses both R and, and Python. It's very helpful, it's more practical and covers all the algorithms and provides the codes uh, graciously. So I highly recommend that uh, if you are looking for a book and it doesn't cost anything. So today he's gonna close our seminar uh, conference by talking about AI and FinTech. Thank you so much Sanji for accepting our invitation. Please go ahead. Thanks Hussain. Uh, very, very happy to be here and, and I, I have had a great time listening to the other talks which were just fantastic. So. You, you came up with a great program. Um, I just have to say that I work at Amazon as an Amazon scholar and my opinions here are my own. And uh, so just the disclaimer. So today what I wanna do is I wanna sort of talk a little bit about what I've been doing in my research for the last two, three years and give some perspective on where I think uh, AI and machine learning are gonna intersect with the academic work in finance. So hopefully uh, this will help uh, many of the students here on the, on the, on the, on the meeting as well. So I want to just sort of talk about three big points. One is uh, fintech is really a disintermediation process, uh, which is being enabled by tech, mostly machine learning and AI. Uh, second, I'll talk about what deep learning is doing and how uh, econometrics is related to deep learning. I think Joe started talking about that as well. And then the third thing I want to talk about is doing uh, financial research with machine learning at scale with types of with alternative types of data that uh, you might find very useful now to do as a PhD student because very little has been done in that area. Uh, just a quick definition of FinTech. FinTech really applies to three areas. You can think of it as uh, in act, uh, active in raising capital, like crowdsourcing, for example, allocating investing capital, maybe robo-advising is an example, and then transferring capital, which the blockchain system we've, we've spoken about also does. And there are many, many other examples. But the key idea of FinTech really is that it's a technology and it's, it's basically eliminating or reducing the cost of the middleman in finance. And I think Cam alluded to this, that there's, uh, you know, there's a huge cost uh, of people in the middle. Uh, uh, Thomas Philippon at NYU did a really nice paper five years ago on this in disintermediation, the intermediation costs. And you can see roughly for the last 140 years, it's remained stable at about 2% uh, of the face value of financial transactions. And that's a pretty big chunk of money. And we know that you go to a financial advisor, you pay uh, one to 2%, percent a robot advisor trying to you know, come in and offer that at 25 basis points. Uh, this is just a quick landscape of what's out there in the fintech world. And uh, one of the things I want to point out here is that fintech is not just startups. Okay, Fintech uh, using ML and AI is happening at the bigger companies in much, much larger quantity uh, than it's happening in the startup space as well. The only thing is that there's about 8,000 different fintech startups now in the US, and that's a very big number. So, so they are going to have an impact uh, over time. I also try to think of fintech and the relationship to AI ML as a more recent phenomenon than fintech itself. 
And if you look at the, the total value of investments in fintech companies um, until say, you know, June of this year, you can see there was sort of a, a low phase in the beginning. And then there was a phase where, you know, funding went up and then sort of dropped off. And part of this drop off here was really because uh, the big banks uh, started buying out these fintechs as a competitive step. And what was really happening in this phase was a lot of process uh, automation that was disintermediating the space. So I try to, I, I think more of this as being the blue collar, as the removal of the blue collar activity in, in, in finance. And now we are seeing a new phase where we are seeing AI and ML use for much higher order, the higher order bits are being sort of automated. Uh, for example, you know, automated lending and things of that sort using uh, judgment with much larger quantities of data than we did for simple e-loan type lending. The three big game changers, you should all know this, is a lot of mathematical innovations from the 60s until now in different types of architectures for deep neural nets. Uh, LSTMs were the rage, they've fallen off because now we've got this new uh, uh, you know, technology called the transformer. Uh, I'll be talking about that later. And then a lot of big data to fuel these models. And finally, hardware, okay? So we need three things. We need a lot of compute, we need a lot of data, and we need mathematical, uh, and, and computational architectures that actually do the job for us. And all these three things have come to a head in the last few years. So we are seeing sort of a, a, a new wave of AI that's really taking over the world. Now in finance, FinTech has sort of permeated, I'm gonna give a few uh, sets of examples, but the key point I wanna mention here is that what you'll notice of FinTech right now is, FinTech is using techniques like AI ML because the sort of things that are getting automated that econometrics couldn't do. Okay, so for example, fraud prevention is using very highly nonlinear models that linear models in econometrics actually can't do effectively enough. Uh, people like Bridgewater, for example, are recording keystrokes and trying to sort of you know, train machines to do what traders do by recording the screen and, and the keystrokes of the traders. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, has sort of replaced a large amount of traders with automated machines. And if you take a look at the UBS trading floor in 2008 versus 2016, you get a clear idea of how you know, white collar work is actually being replaced also uh, by AI ML. Uh, this is just a cartoon here of you know, the new trading room is just gonna become a machine and uh, the dog there is just gonna be guarding the machine. There's a further joke to that, that there's a human at the door and what's the human doing? The human is just there to feed the dog as needed. Uh, companies like JP Morgan have made huge investments uh, they have actually three different groups that, that, uh, that do AI and machine learning. And you can see they cover the gamut of predictive work to financial crime, uh, to you know, secure data, uh, client experience. So it's covering sort of the gamut of activities uh, inside a large, a large bank. And uh, there are many, many examples if you go to their research page uh, and look at the great work they're doing. Uh, a nice example of this is, is actually four years old. They have contract intelligence, which actually now cross-checks contracts. And that saves about 360,000 hours of work each year. Okay, so this was sort of in the process automation phase of FinTech. Conversational AI is another great example. Plenty of customer service stuff, but also even uh, negotiation uh, things happen through, you know, companies like Top Boss, Narrative Science, and so on. A lemonade uses bots to give you a customized experiences, uh, you know, to, to get you the right insurance contract. A lemonade is, is a fast growing insurance company. And uh, we are even seeing robotics in finance. So in Japan, Mizuho Financial Group has a robot called Pepper and Pepper uses image rec face recognition uh, you know, tools uh, to roam around the bank lobby. And what it does is it, it, uh, it detects the most stressed out customer in the lobby and then approaches them and engages them in a conversation to give them customer service. Uh, similarly, that's something happening with, with RBS as well, okay? So once again, if you just you know, look back at all the, all the use cases I just showed you, uh, the single defining feature is that these are not econometrics based, okay? These are actually based on, on different types of data and they're based on machine learning algorithms that econometrics uh, wouldn't really be able to help with. Okay, so that was just sort of a quick warm up. What, we'll, uh, what I'll do now is sort of do a quick traversal into the area of deep learning, talk a little bit about research in here uh, two points to note. One is that I call this the non-linearity revolution. Most of our econometrics models tend to be linear or sort of exponential affine type models. And those are also, for all practical purposes, linear models. 
Uh, what we are seeing now is a nonlinearity in the data and mapping that uh, data to actually outcomes uh, through, through neural nets is, is proving to be pretty effective. And the second thing is that deep learning is enabling us to actuate data that's not tabular, okay? That's data that comes in forms like text and voice and, and, and images. And so doing research in those areas uh, in finance has actually become pretty hard. Uh, so these were the three people who stuck out through the AI winter. Uh, Jeff Hinton is at, uh, the, you know, the head of Google AI. Jan Lukun at NYU is also the head of, of Facebook research. Uh, and, and Joshua Bengio, uh, the three of them actually built what I would call today's modern deep learning paradigms. And then of course they spawned you know, hundreds of students that are now out there building these things at, uh, at companies. Uh, so let's, let's, let's talk about this in, in a simple canonical example, just to show you how you could take ideas from deep learning and actually port them over to finance quite easily. All right, so, so image recognition, and in this case, the simple, what I call the hello world example of, of deep learning is, is digit recognition, okay? So if you take any of the digits, let's take the three over here, it's sitting inside a 28 by 28 pixel frame. So 28 times 28 is 784 numbers, and each row of this data frame here would be 28 numbers where zero is white in the pixel, and 256 would be complete filled filling the pixel with ink and so you get numbers between 0 and 256 describing every pixel in the 784 pixel frame and deep learning has been extremely effective at training models to figure out from the 784 numbers across a large data set uh, how to recognize digits this is sort of used in atm machines and uh, it's it's absolutely impossible uh, possible to implement this literally in five lines of code today in jupyter and python and, and train models uh, in about a minute or two, okay, to do this kind of a task. So the question then came up, what if we started thinking about markets as images and try to predict whether the S&P 500 will go up or down the next day by looking at the previous 30 days as an image and saying, can I use the previous 30 days data uh, as an image and recognize whether that image is predictive of an up or down movement of the S&P 500. So the way you did that, so we wrote a paper on this, uh, really to see whether markets could really be efficient or not. And I'll give you the quick idea for it and then move on. So if I have a data set, which goes, let's say from 1960 to 2016, so many, many years of data, I have every stock that went in and out of the S&P index, 500 index over that year. It turns out there are 5370 stocks that existed in the S&P over that span of time. And I also have the S&P index in a column here. Now, this is very easy. You go to Chris CompuStat, just dump this data, simple thing to do. Convert that data into returns. So the blue here is returns, daily returns. And the S&P, we just either put one and zero depending on whether it went up or down uh, on the next day, okay? So I've got this data set. And what I wanna do is I wanna take 30 days of history. So let's say I'm trying to predict this day. I go back 30 days in, in, in the table. And I say, I have 500 stocks for those 30 days. So 530 is 15,000 numbers. That's literally an image of 15,000 pixels. And if I can construct one of these for every day, so I do it for 55 years and I have a massive data set of, of about 14,000 images of the market. And then I wanna just train a machine learning algorithm to take those images and predict uh, whether the next day the S&P will go up or down. Okay, so very simple exercise. You can do this uh, for, a, for a cost project, for example. Now, the problem that arises is, obviously, if I look at the last 30 days, I don't have the same 500 stocks. Stocks go in and out of the index quite frequently, and so I get NA values here. And so we were stuck with a feature engineering problem, that is, how do I solve this problem? I don't want to just fill up dummy data in there. So what we did was, we did a very simple thing. We just converted the data into percentile values for every day. And now I've also reduced the dimension of the data set. So I took 19 percentiles a day, 19 into 30 days back is 570 numbers. And so now I have an image with 570 pixels that's completely filled. So now there are no NA values everywhere and I can, I can fit the model to this. All right, so how, how well did we do? We, we did rolling blocks. We took 5,000 images leading up to the day we want to predict and then try to predict the next day up and down. Turns out the overall accuracy across many, many, many rolling um, predictions is about 60%. Okay, so we're 60% good if we, if we train a model and then hold it fixed for five days. If we hold it fixed for 10 days, the accuracy starts going down because it's not now current. 
and then quickly it goes down to about 55%. Now you might think 60% is good because you, know, you're, you have in mind a 50-50 coin toss, but that's not true because really what you wanna do is ask the question, how many times uh, does the S&P 500 go up versus down you know, daily? So I asked this to a group of mutual fund managers and the consensus they came up with was two thirds of the days the market goes up and one third of the days the market goes down. And uh, the answer actually, that's wrong. And if that was the case, that is, it's two thirds, then any algorithm that said the market goes up always will be right two thirds of the time, in which case this number is pretty bad, right? And uh, it turns out the correct answer is 52.7% of the days the market goes up and the other days it goes down. So 60.5 versus 52.7 is the comparison you need to make. But it turns out there's enough noise around this number that markets for all practical purposes are efficient uh, to this kind of technology. But notice what we just did. Instead of testing weak form efficiency of the S&P 500 prediction over the history of the S&P 500, I've been able to test it over the history of the entire S&P 500 stocks. And so we're able to do a test of WIFO market efficiency with a much larger conditional history uh, and, and, and do that with machine learning, okay? So we fitted many different kinds of machine learning models to it. And it turns out the deep learning model, which is the most nonlinear, tends to perform a lot better over the next 10 days. So that's the 58.2%. And all the ones that are sort of quasi-linear or slightly lighter machine learning models actually do pretty badly, all right? So the markets by, by and large, I think are pretty efficient to this kind of attack uh, from the machine learning community. The second example is option pricing. We often know the disadvantage of the Black-Scholes equation or, or variants of it, you know, Gotch model based things or, or even stochastic volatility and jump diffusion type models. So why not just take a big machine learning model and train it on a big cluster of option prices? You can re retrain this every week if you like. And this is what Andrew Lowe tried to do in 1994 with very you know, inferior technology at that time. Now we are able to do this uh, in, in five minutes you know, using machine learning tools that we have. So I took 300,000 option prices. I took the inputs to the option pricing, uh, to those option prices, and I trained a model with literally very few lines of code. And the only financial knowledge I used to do this was the property of option prices that they are homogeneous of degree one in the stock price and the strike price. And that allowed me to normalize the call prices by the strike price so that across multiple companies, I have a normalized data frame that allows me to actually train the data set a little bit better. That's all the lines of code I needed in TensorFlow. I ran training on it. And then what you wanna do is you wanna take the actual price and look at the predicted price in sample first. You can see my mean squared error is extremely small. So the model in a minute has learned how option prices are priced in the market. And then you do it out of sample as well and you get pretty much the same accuracy. This is a really perfect use case simply because out of, there's no overfitting in sample. And the simple reason for it is people aren't changing the models they use to price options in the market every day. And so if you train it today, it's gonna probably reflect the way option prices are gonna appear the next day as well. So, you know, do you tell people take a derivatives class and learn a whole bunch of stochastic calculus or you send them off to do machine learning because they can now actually get uh, much richer option pricing models than, than they get with, with stochastic. You do random forest, Joe mentioned random forest as well, pretty much the same result. And, you know, you want to see the actual price and the predicted price sitting on the 45 degree line. Okay, third example. Uh, this is a paper that we just published, in fact, came out a couple of months back. Uh, we took uh, about a million, 100,000 uh, 100, know, uh, uh, observations on Crunchbase. Uh, you, you can buy a subscription and, uh, and downloaded that and tried to see whether we could actually do uh, you know, startup uh, success prediction from everything on Crunchbase. So we got a bunch of Crunchbase stuff collected US patent data, put it all together and had about 170 different features uh, in, in, in the data set. And then we did two exercises. One is, can we predict exits? And can we predict follow-on funding? Now, this is two of the standard metrics that we use in venture capital. Uh, just keeping it very short, uh, you can see that the accuracies are about 89% for ensemble models, okay? So we do multi-layer perceptrons, random forest actually boost. We ensemble the whole thing as well, which is sort of a wisdom of the crowds approach. 
and we get about 89% accuracy, uh, you know, in predicting uh, exit models. And then for, you can see for the IPO exit or the acquired exit or the failed outcomes, so there are three different types of outcomes. You can see the confusion matrix here with a very heavy diagonal. Uh, the precision recall is pretty high for almost all of these things, okay? Uh, we also did a fourth thing that is companies that remain private. So, you know, you get similar accuracies for, for that kind of exercise as well. And this is pretty remarkable because why would you be able to predict nine, you know, at, at an accuracy level, get nine out of 10 of these things right, when uh, VCs may only be able to get two out of 10 hits, you know, accurately. So machines can probably parse a lot of data that's out there and do a job that's pretty successful. Uh, you talked about interpretably earlier today, and of course, the standard methods like Shapley values that everybody uses. So we, we ran Shapley values and then looked at, you know, what were the main features that distinguished uh, the companies from falling into these different categories. And you can see the things like has a LinkedIn account, uh, has an IPO score, the number of acquisitions they've done so far, the number of investors in the round, all these things matter and we can rank them in terms of things. But you can notice empty fields, which is missing data also helps. Uh, and turns out companies that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that fail tend to do a lot of that and those that get acquired also tend to do a lot of that. Okay, so, so far, every example I've talked about is really using numeric data or categorical data. And we tend to call that tabular data. And the bulk of machine learning to date has been on tabular data. And the bulk of work that we do in finance in academia has been on tabular data. We are slowly seeing natural language processing creeping into finance. It's been happening over the last 20 years, but at a slow pace and it's picking up now. But it's become very, very important. Text is forward looking. A lot of time series data is backward looking. Okay, so this is a big reason to start looking at, at alternative data because it might have forward looking information. Uh, there's a huge availability of text, much more than tabular data. And so that's another incentive. Text requires machine learning. And so you're gonna have to sort of marry traditional econometrics and machine learning to get there. And it's good to invest in it as a PhD student because the science and engineering resource bar is somewhat high in this area as you'll, you'll, you'll see. So one of the things I wanted to do when I joined Amazon was to try and democratize uh, this, this natural language processing field to make it much easier for academics to do it. So I'm gonna show you some examples now where you can actually see that it's slowly gonna get easier or democratizable you know, for academics to work on. Uh, so far, natural language processing has been all about taking, the, taking the, the text, counting words and scoring, which is very, very successful. It's worked very well. Locker and McDonald word lists are extremely good. People have been using them for a lot. And a lot of the time, it's really about feature engineering and converting the text into tabular data. What we really wanna do is not convert the text into tabular data anymore, but use it as text with its own types of representations and not just counting of words, okay? Uh, this is just an example we published in JFDS uh, a couple of years back where we took all the Enron data and it turns out after you clean all the emails and you arrange all the data and you do everything, there's only one feature that really matters and that feature is email length. If you look at the last two years of Enron's, Enron's life, the average length of the top 150 managers' emails was 400 characters if you throw out all the forwarded content and things like that. And you can see it remained pretty stable over the second last year of Enron's life. First six months, the same, 400 characters per email. And then dramatically six months before Enron's demise, management started emailing less and you got 200 characters per email. It literally dropped, uh, you know, precipitously. And in all the regressions and stuff in the paper, pretty much this is the feature that comes out to be the most significant. Now this is really, really thin. This is not even machine learning. This is sort of, you know, simple counting of, of characters. Uh, one of my friends then, of course, took, uh, of course, some of the data and put it into, you know, the standard Locker McDonald four word lists uh, for positivity, negativity, uh, uncertainty, and litigiousness. He made a movie of it. So I, let me see if I can show you that movie. So his name is Jim Callahan. And he, he made a movie of the last two years of Enron's life. And so if I play this movie, you can see the negative. These are the managers and the email traffic going between them. And you can actually see, I can speed this up a little bit. And you can see he's, he's taking things from Factiva and putting them here as well, but you can see what's happening slowly. The litigiousness language starts increasing. You can see these purple lines coming up. You can see the negative stuff getting a lot more than the positive stuff. And we are still in the first 
it, it, we're not into the last year of Enron's life. We're getting there. But this is sort of a nice example of visualizing uh, you know, alternative types of data in, in looking. And you can see at the end, it gets, it gets horrendously red, as you noticed over here, well before uh, Enron actually you know, ended, ended its life. Okay, um, so where am I here? So I call this going from word counts to word embeddings. <clears throat> so the modern style of natural language processing <clears throat> takes documents or sentences or words and drops them into high dimensional space. So originally what we did was we counted words. And we said, how much, you know, what fraction of the words in an SEC filing, for example, had positive connotation or risk connotations, because we had a word list to, to use for counting. But we can also drop things into higher dimensional space. Okay, so I can think of, say, taking a word like uh, like litigation and dropping it into a 300, uh, representing as a 300 number vector. And so that's really a coordinate point in 300 dimensional space. And so you can take all the SEC filings in the world and put them into a 300 dimensional space and see which companies go close to each other, which companies are far from each other, and maybe they're clusters that are going to perform worse, and so on and so forth. Okay, so a lot of that has been happening. And I think a lot of academics in, in finance are now using word embeddings, because it's really a, every word or every document is embedded in 300 dimensional space. And then these word embeddings have gotten better over time, they become contextual. And these are the new class of embeddings uh, that came out of, uh, you know, transformer work. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that now. So to give everybody an idea of, I, I call this my transition from econometrics to machine learning you know, slide. Everything in econometrics you can think of as an encoder. I have some input variables, I put it into a linear regression line model and it spits out an output. Okay, so I've basically encoded the inputs into an output. Same thing with logistic regression, except we take the encoded input, further encode it by passing it into a sigmoid function and it spits out an output as well. Deep learning is just a big extension of that. You're taking inputs, you're representing them in a particular way, then you pass them through more and more maybe logistic layers or other types of layers. So each of these is a representation of the data, the initial data that you have. And that data could be text. And now when you're representing text, these vectors tend to be 30,000, 40,000 uh, you know, long. And so the encodings have to be more complicated. And then the output could be, you know, anything. It could be, you know, a, a sentiment score. It could be a classification and so on. Just like you have encoders, you also have decoders. So what's happening here is I've got a bunch of input data. I pass it through functions, mathematical functions that get smaller and smaller in number so that the inner layer here is just two functions. And so the output of this is going to be two numbers, one from here, one from here. And that is a smaller dimensional representation of the input. Likewise, I can take this and pass it into uh, mathematical functions that eventually spit out the same dimension of numbers as I had in the input. Okay, that part over here is a decoder. So it's taking this, the output of these two neurons here and producing output here. Now, if I train this neural network to have inputs and I train it such that it, it shrinks it and then expands it to give back the same output as the input, we call that an autoencoder. And if I train such a neural network, then in here, what I have is a nonlinear dimension reduction or nonlinear PCA effectively that's taking place. Okay, so, so we have encoding and we have decoding and all that is done in neural networks and we slowly see why this is valuable. This of course leads to a huge parameter explosion because these neural networks have millions and hundreds of millions of parameters. So let's talk about the transformer architecture. So we're going to talk particularly about text. And if I think of this side of the architecture as the encoder and this side of the architecture as the decoder, then I could use this, let's say, for translation. Let's take a very simple thing. So this is a very, very famous paper. Well, attention is all you need because it took the standard encoder decoder architecture and applied it to text in a slightly different way. Uh, so that context, which is very important in text, could get, uh, could get uh, collected as well. So over here, on the left-hand side, let's say I put in a bunch of English words. They pass through a bunch of layers, and they come out with some numerical vector representation, which then goes into the decoder, which then converts those numbers into German words. So then I could have encoding of English and decoding into German over here. 
But what the encoder in English is doing is, it is actually representing words that go in here into numerical vectors that hopefully have enough context so that the German decoder could actually take that context and come up with the best German translation. All right. So the second uh, set of work that followed on this is, is BERT. Okay. So BERT does two or three things. It exploits the encoder architecture of the transformer, which is takes this stack or this neural network stack. And what it does is it trains it to learn two tasks. One task is we feed it a sentence and we blank out a couple of words and we train it to learn those missing words. But we train it in such a way that every word in the sentence pays attention to every other word in the sentence through this attention layer. The way that's done is by, uh, by putting weights so that every word actually has a weight on all the other words in the sentence so that it learns which, which words in that sentence are more important for the context of that word than any other word. And the second task is trained on called NSP, on next sentence prediction. And so we feed it two sentences and, and ask it, is the second sentence truly following the previous sentence? Now, the advantage of this is that it can be trained on all of Wikipedia text. So we feed it lots and lots of Wikipedia text. And for each sentence in Wikipedia, we blank out a few words and first train it. So it starts learning the relationships between which words occur with each other over a larger context than was possible before with sort of autoregressive type models. And then the sentence prediction task also allows it to learn context across sentences, which is very valuable, okay? Now you could take that because this trained model, actually, if you pass a, a document or a se sentence through here, it'll spit out a numerical representation here that can then be passed into further neural net layers for a specific task, let's say to classify a company as having positive or negative sentiment. We call that transfer learning. So we're gonna take this basic idea and now look at what I call multimodal machine learning at scale. And this is my pitch for where people should be putting effort into sort of, you know, in, in, into sort of their PhD thesis. There's a lot of work to be done over here. I call this also bringing AI closer to being human. So there was this very famous paper called the unreasonable effectiveness of data that talked about data. And it really is about 10 years old. And it talked about how effective data, large data was in natural language processing, in tabular processing, in image processing. But it was talking about these as unimodal things, okay? So each modality was by itself. What I think we're seeing now is a new age of the unreasonable effectiveness of multimodal data. That is, can we take data of different modalities and build models, financial models, that'll do a lot better than, than models that are unimodal. And so there are lots of modalities. You can think of probably more, but there's tabular. That's the one we spend all our time with. There's text, which we're spending more time with. There's images, there's voice. There are hedge funds out there that are looking at the voice signatures of the CFO in earnings calls and comparing it to the previous four quarters to see if there's a trading signal. There's obviously video and there's haptic signals. Okay. So this is just a picture of a trader when a trader makes a trading decision, it's completely multimodal. He's looking at graphs, he's looking at text in the news stream, he's looking at numbers. And so it's an obviously multimodal situation. So why do we build financial models that are unimodal? We should not be doing that. <clears throat> okay, so data and econometrics has traditionally been done on tabular data. Machine learning is also very successful on unimodal tabular, unimodal text and unimodal image data. And humans are not multimodal. We're inherently you know, multi-sensory beings. And like God, we'd like to create our machines in our own image. That is Genesis 127. And in fact, there's a debate in the machine learning community right now as to why do machines need so much data to learn, like how to recognize, let's say, an image, when children learn it with very few examples. And I think partly a conjecture is that the answer might be that children are multimodal. They're not doing unimodal processing. And, and so maybe having multimodality might also reduce the amount of data that we actually want for this hungry machine learning beast. Okay, so let's take an example in finance of multimodality. So, so, so right now, credit ratings is a big activity, okay? Credit quality is being, being used in machine learning a lot. It's basically unimodal, it's done on tabular data. So we train a machine learning model. Let's say I'm a rating agency. I train a sophisticated neural network on tabular data 
which predicts the property of default or, or a rating and so on. And that's the training phase. We train a model. And then of course we can use the model to predict ratings. So what is typically done in a rating process is the machine learning model spits out an initial rating. And then after that, the analysts will actually take the internal memos and text that they have, read it, get into a room as a committee and decide whether to notch the rating up or down. So the natural language understanding or the NLP part of this rating process is actually a human process. It is not a machine learning process. Then they issue a rating. Let's say they issue a rating of double A to a company. Company comes back and says, how did you guys give me that double A rating? Analyst goes back to all the internal memos and, and the data that they have, the tabular data, and generates a story for why that rating was issued, usually a couple of paragraphs. That's what we call natural language generation. Okay, the, the, the human part is natural language generation. Now, the hypothesis is why not build a machine learning model that does take tabular and ingests all the text that the analyst was reading into one model and train the model entirely on that. Shouldn't you get a better model? Probably yes, you get a more accurate model. You don't have a human in the loop as much. And finally, because the, the work in computer science or interpretably is getting more and more advanced, we're able to actually fashion an interpretation using a machine as well. So this is uh, something we've done recently. Okay, so let's go through it a little more in detail. These are the standard variables that people use for rating processes. Uh, you can have either expected default probability or you can have, uh, you know, they, and these features are good because you can see they relate quite well uh, to the expected default probability. So I'm going to take an example. We took basically over 2000 different credit ratings issued by many SP, it's an open source data set. Uh, we have uh, different types of ratios in there. But now what we're going to do is we're going to look at multiple categories and make it a credit rating prediction problem. Can we take the accounting statements values and predict which rating they should fall into? So this is sort of just the frequency count of the different types of ratings in that data set. But we're going to do a couple more things. We're going to add the industry code because we know now, Viral has done a lot of work on this, that industry is, is a good feature to have in a credit rating prediction data set. And we're going to add in the SEC filings, which has not been done before. Okay. And we're going to call that data set, not just the numerical data set, but add a column of SEC filings to it. We're going to call that tab text because it's got tabular data and textual data. We're not going to stop there. We're going to take the text column, the SEC filings. We're going to take the management discussion section. We're going to score it for positivity, negativity, litigiousness, polarity, fraud, readability, and all these different things. Okay, so we built a whole bunch of scoring tools. These are not Locker McDonald at all, They're completely different scoring mechanisms. And we call that enhanced tab text. And then we fitted a machine learning model to this entire data set, which has massive text in one column, bunch of numerical scores in other columns, and wanted to see how it does that. Now to do that, you need machine, uh, you know, heavy machine uh, technology. And so we've done that on something called Amazon SageMaker. Okay, so one of my privileges is to work with the machine learning team at Amazon, and uh, they, they support a lot of research, you know, which we would not be able to do at the university, uh, because the, the hardware and software you need for this is, is just not affordable on, on, at, at a university. So I'm using SageMaker here, and within SageMaker, we've built a finance set of tools so that academics can actually use this and, uh, and, uh, and get started. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly show you what's done. So first of all, I need to get the SEC filings. And so I'm, I'm actually gonna go to my Amazon dashboard. So I'm running this on Amazon's platform here. This is something called SageMaker Jumpstart. And if you Google that, you'll be able to find it. And if you go into Jumpstart, you'll get a screen here where we have lots and lots of different models built. And I'm gonna actually go into corporate rating prediction at some point, but if I click on this card here and open it up, it basically opens up a Jupyter notebook. There's a bunch of things here to set up, bring up your sort of environment, which you just run without thinking. And then you get an API here. So I've already run this before because it, it's a little computationally heavy and I have this ready to show you. Here's my API. 
What I've done is I've basically put in four tickers, for example, Amazon, Google, 27904 is the SEC CIK code for Delta Airlines and Facebook. I just randomly picked four. I said I won the 10K, uh, 10Q filings from uh, for the last, uh, for two years, 2019, January to 2020, December. I just have to input this in here. I can actually input a list of these into another variable and just sit, point it to that variable here. So if I have you know, 200 of these, I don't have to do a big thing over here, but that's basically my single API call. And when I run this API, all, all I'll, this is just a machine. So I'm actually running it on a compute intensive machine. Uh, and I, I sort of say how much, how many gigabytes I want to allot to this. It's all happening in the cloud. I kick off this, this block of code it, it runs off a process just the way you would do with, you know, getting data from words or anywhere else. And once it's done, it gives me back a data set and the data set is here. So it's pulled out of the, the 32 of these it starts from index zero, the, the SEC filings and the management discussion section on the side. So I can join this now with my tabular data and go ahead and do, and do machine learning. So let's go back here to the, uh, Oh, no, this is not the way I want. So this was what I just showed you. So the way we do this is we join the data sets and now I need a machine learning algorithm that will actually take a data, a, a table of data, not just a, like a spreadsheet with tabular data, but a, but a table of data that actually has a whole bunch of of text in it as well. And I'm gonna marry this, okay, to, uh, uh, to, to, to the tabular data. So this is pretty heavy machinery. Uh, it really is a complete black box. You go in here and you just run it and it'll take the, the, it'll take the text column and convert it into a, a, a different representation. It'll marry that, uh, that text column with all the other numerical data you have and it'll run a massive number of machine learning models automatically in one line of code. And it'll take all those models, it'll ensemble those models, so you get the wisdom of the crowds, and then it'll overlay on top of that K4 bagging and a whole bunch of other techniques. Okay, we, this whole thing is called a stack ensemble, and uh, it, it works really, really well. So just to give you a quick idea of what we did, we, we did two tasks. We said, let's just see if we can predict whether a company will be investment grade or below investment grade using all the SEC filing data plus all the balance sheet data. And we also said, let's try and predict the exact rating of that company. And these are standard tasks that, that people who trade in credit markets undertake because they will try to uh, see, oh, company's investment grade now, what's the chance that the prediction is that you go below investment grade and see if there's a trade there. Uh, we, we ran the data many ways with no text, with text, just to see how it improved. And the basic results are here. I'm only showing you one of the, the, the paper just got published in an IEEE uh, conference proceedings. And you can see we ran all these different machine learning models and the ensemble. You get about 84% accurate uh, if you don't use text at all. And these are done over 10 replications. So this is, you get a bit of a noise error around it. The error is very small. So for practical purposes, every round of training gives you the same thing. These are reported on a completely holdout test data set. Okay, So these are not in sample um, at all. You can see that if you add the NLP scores, that is you just took the, the text of the, of the management discussion section and scored it for positivity and negativity and didn't include the text yet, you go up by about a percent. But then if you add in the full text of the MDNA, you can go up a little bit more to about three, four percent. Now this is a lot, okay? By the way, people do care about two, three percent in, in this literature. But what is most important is you get very, very accurate models with, with the text in there, because even when it's off by a rating, it's off by one rating. It's not really off by more than that. Okay, so this is just a quick example of how you can use text along with that to do it automatically. Now, the moment you start doing bagging and deep ensembling, you can get that up to about 90%. So there are many, many techniques that you get automatically at the press of a button if you use the automated environment that's over here. Let's take a, set, uh, let's take a second example. Uh, in fact, this was fun because I showed it to Ed Altman and he really liked it. But what we did was we said, let's take Altman's Z-score model. And many of you might have studied it in, in finance courses, but it's 
probably the most widely used credit scoring model for corporate scoring, uh, simply because it can be applied to private companies, small and medium enterprises, unlike uh, the Moody's, uh, you know, KMV type models that require, pu you know, publicly traded companies only. Literally, Orkin's model has eight financial variables that you can pick off from anywhere, CompuStat, for example, and you convert them into five ratios. So these are, this, is the, this is what I call the five famous ratios of Altman. And then Altman puts them into a Z-score model like this. And you know, the higher Z-scores are good companies, the lower Z-scores are bad companies. What we're going to do is take these five variables and add SEC text to it. So the way this works in Jumpstart is you basically have a data set, which we, I just showed you how to download of the SEC filings. You, you, you join that data set with Altman's five ratios, which you will have collected from CompuStat. This gives you a tap text data set. I'm just showing you the top of it. So there are five numerical ratios here. You have a rating, which is the actual rating of the company, the label. And then you have the industry code, which is a categorical variable. And you have this. What I want to do is just throw this thing into, into machine learning and say, fit it. So think of this as, hey, I'm running logistic regression on numerical data. What if I could just throw in a bunch of text columns and don't change anything I do and still be able to fit logistic regressions? Okay, so that's sort of the, the mental model you want to have. So we took that data frame. We also added all the numerical scores because we have an API that actually does that. And so if I go back here and show you this, uh, this, uh, this particular tool, further down in the tool, you get uh, another API that allows you to score, summarize the text and also score the text. So I can quickly go down here and show you the scoring. So the single API here, you just point it to the, your, your CSV file and what it will do is it'll automatically add all the scores. So if your CSV file started with these columns and you said score this column, it'll literally add to the data set all the scores. You just let it run and it, and it takes care of that as well. So that was done. Now we have a data frame that contains a very large amount of text in here and a bunch of numerical values. In fact, if you go up here, you can see that when you download these SEC filings using our tool, each filing is now sitting in here. And if I look at the text, we have completely clean text. Okay, so there was a lot of sort of engineering work here to make this clean so that you have clean text that you can actually use for further work. But instead of doing this yourself and spending six months, uh, you now have a tool that will allow you to download, you know, the SEC filings and, and give it back to you as a data set uh, in, in, in no time at all. So if I drop the text column and I fit the ratings, to these different values here, I get, I get a model in one line of code, okay? So it literally you say predict and dot fit and point it to the training data. And then uh, it'll also evaluate on the test data set that you've created, the separate, completely hold out separate. So we take the full data, data set and do 80-20 split. You get 85% accuracy. And then if you rerun the thing with text, it goes up to over 93%. So one of the potentials here is that by taking SEC text, which is of good quality because it's you know, regulated and so on, and adding it to the models we currently have in finance, we should be able to build much better models and do better research. Now, the same Altman model, in fact, you can get over here. So if you go into um, you know, this, this card here and click on it and launch it, you will end up with a card that looks like this. And then you can actually train the notebook to do that. So this is actually a notebook that will train Altman's model. You can see I've got the same features over here. It trains the model for you. You literally make a small split of the data into train and test data sets. And then you just run, run this code block. It goes off and runs all those different models for you, comes back and gives you back uh, the best model. But the other advantage of this is you can actually deploy it uh, to an endpoint. And that's if you want to implement the model for real, it can sit in an endpoint and then you can call the endpoint to make further predictions uh, as well. Let's go back here. So now we get to transformers and I'll try and wrap it up with saying, I know I'm, I'm running a little bit late. So transformers are these deep neural networks I just mentioned. And what we did was we passed a lot of data into the transformer to train it to know natural language. And the standard BERT base model is about 110 million parameters. And this has been trained on Wikipedia text. 
So what it does, it learns the context of words and the relationship of words inside Wikipedia. And so it can actually make better predictions. The, re the way it makes better predictions is that it produces vector representations of input text that then has better relationships to other vector representations. So for example, if I was just doing sentiment scoring of news articles on finance, I would be able to get all the good sentiment articles in one area of the space and the other ones in the other area of the space. So the representations are then run. So here's another example. Example: We just published this paper in JFDS. Uh, we actually did train a model on all of this Wikipedia text plus 10 years of SEC filings as well. Okay, so now it's not only, it's like sending a kid to school, he learns a lot about language, and then you send them to undergrad and do undergrad in finance, and they learn more about financial language now, so they get even better at interpreting financial language. So, so we sort of trained a model on all that text. And then we did a simple example where we have text and we have the, the score, so we have a mixed tabular, and we're trying to predict whether it's neutral, negative, or positive. This is a very well-known data set that everybody tests it on. But to train this thing, we needed heavy computation. So we had to actually take uh, sort of a, a platform which actually runs a training exercise on Wikipedia and SEC text. We had to run about 250,000 epochs of training on machines. Each of these machines has eight GPUs on it. And so the compute required is extremely intensive to train these large machines. And you probably all heard of things like GPT-3 and all that are even more uh, bigger than this. So this kind of runs for a week. It tends to be expensive. But it gives you a model eventually that you can use for machine learning that it'll do slightly better than just base models. So if you just use standard machine learning on you know, scores like Lockheed and Ronald Words, you'll get about 86%. If you use these BERT models, the transformer models that are context rich, you automatically go from 86 to about 92%. And then if you use a BERT type model that has been further trained on SEC filing uh, as well, you can go up to about 95, 96%. Okay, now you might think that 92% to 96 and 96% is only a 4% increase, but notice that's half the error, right? Error is about 8% because we're getting 92% accurate here. You can halve the error by sort of training these models further for specific things. And the industry has been doing this a lot. Uh, we've trained models to do, you know, biology, uh, better, better analysis of biology text and the models we've trained here uh, do better on financial text. So how do you get these models? We sort of put this out. Uh, in fact, this got released yesterday, so it's kind of new. And uh, and so you can actually go to uh, the same thing. SageMaker is the, the AWS machine learning platform. Uh, we put this Roberta SEC model out there. You literally open it and deploy it. And then it's sitting there. And the moment you throw text at it, it gives you back a vector representation that you can use in models. Okay, so you open a notebook so as an example to do it, and I'll quickly show you that so you can see how it works. So if I go to jumpstart here, I click on any of these, these models. So let me just pick one of them. I'll click on this. Notice it says deploy. If I deploy, it'll actually put an endpoint here. I've already done that because that it takes some time to spin up the endpoint. So the endpoint is here. If I click on that, it gives me a notebook. And this is my notebook. I can basically run this notebook and it'll actually show me how to fit models using the vector representations from that specially trained finance model. So I actually ran it also before. So you can see these are just startups here. And I put in some simple sentence like simply stupid, irrelevant, and deeply, truly, bottomlessly cynical. And when you call that back, it gives you a representation of 768 numbers. So the size of vector that it gives back is this. And that entire sentence has been encoded now. This, these are only the first five elements of that vector. It's encoded that way, okay? So one of the, the standard examples I, I, I'll show you very quickly is, there's this famous tweets data set where it, we're trying to detect which tweets are about a disaster that's happening and which tweets are not about a disaster that's happening. So if you download that data set, uh, financial people like this data set and the reason they, they like it is because they want to build a system that keeps reading the tweet stream. And if it's about a disaster, then they know they need to take some urgent trading action. So the data set is here, it's got about 12,000 tweets in it, 11,000 tweets. You can see some of them are one, which are the disasters and you wanna train a model on it. And so all you need is literally this block of code. You take, you, you take an 80-20 training test split, you 
you call this function doc to pool embedding, which then calls that endpoint, which you, which you generated when you clicked on that, when you clicked on that application and it gives you back, we're just printing out, you know, progress of this thing. It takes some time to process all that text. And it basically gives you back a, a, a vector of 768 size representation for each and every tweet. And then you can use those tweets in this block of code to train a, a neural network. So we trained that neural network. You can see, I did only 10 rounds of training, literally took one or two seconds to do. And I've gotten up to about 88% accuracy, okay, in being able to predict whether it's, so it's literally one or two clicks and you get the advantage of this model that's actually been trained on a massive amount of, of text. Now these are not stopping, okay? So right now these transformer models are being trained only on text, for example, or only on images to give you vector representations of those things. But only in June this year, the Beijing Academy of, of, of AI just trained the biggest ever model and it's completely multimodal. It's jointly trained on English text, Chinese text and images. And this is getting to the point where we don't have transformer encoder representations only of one modality, we have a joint representation. And so when you see a, a product ad, you see text, words, and prices, and the human being processes all those three things together. And so this kind of a encoder that will give you a representation for that entire product ad uh, is going to be sort of completely multimodal and multilingual. Okay, it's called Wudao 2. It's about 10 times bigger than GPT-3 that came out from OpenAI. Uh, GPT-2 and GPT-3 are the ones that are used to complete your sentences in Gmail. So you're, you're familiar with that as well. But this thing is, in, is, is incredibly huge and has become, uh, you know, become sort of the holy grail, the new thing that's happening right now. Okay, so quick summary. Uh, machine learning begins with a representation of data in any mode as a vector or tensor that you have. Multimodal ML brings machines closer to the way humans interpret multi-sensory data, and we, we want to do research that way. Common use cases of multimodal ML integrate tabular and text data. I've shown you some examples that, that have been published. I've uh, shown you some technology that you can, you can probably use if you like. Uh, transformers have proven better than any other methods because they produce contextual representations. Okay, So before we had counts of words and things of that sort, but they didn't have context, and these transformer models uh, do very, very well at, at keeping context. The state of the art is multimodal transformers like Wudao, and they require massive amounts of distributed computation to scale. And so, you know, I think uh, using cloud, you know, platforms has been very, very successful for my kind of work as well. Okay, so this is just a reference to the paper that was that was actually used to, to create the Wudao. Mm. That's questions. And if you're interested in the SageMaker stuff, uh, there is a whole bunch of links, but what I would suggest is you can just go directly to uh, to SageMaker in Amazon, and, and you know if you have an account, just open it up and use it. None of this is expensive to use, honestly, but the tools are here. So in Jumpstart, we released yesterday, in fact, just released all this stuff so that you know we could do research with it. So you can you can get the corporate credit rating prediction model here, and then adapt it. You can get these uh, text representation models here. You can get uh, the SEC filing downloader over here. And then there are two examples here. Uh, there's an there's, there's a example we did where we tried to take the Paycheck Protection Program and, and uh, take SEC filings and see whether the text of people who returned the money they took in the Paycheck Protection Program was different from the reporting SEC text of companies that did that. Uh, this, in fact, was supported by Pravala, who many of you know. He's got a paper on this, and we took the, the tickers from his paper and basically did a machine learning version of that same paper in this application. And that, if you, if you go in here, you can kind of take run that and take a look at it as well. And then there's a, an example here of doing multi-category classification for SEC filings, so you can use it to download SEC filings. The example here just tries to tell you which industry the company is in and try to predict that, but you could put any other label you want. You could, you could put in, you know, like good companies versus bad companies and, and reuse the code over here. So these are sort of templates for you to do research with that you can take and modify the code and, and finish your research paper in one week instead of six months. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's sort of the, the hopefully, it, it's what I've been excited about over the last couple of years and, and you know, been lucky to have the resource to be able to do this. 
Well, well, thank you, thank you, Sanjeev. This was uh, truly fascinating. Uh, so many questions uh, I have, so I'm, I'm just going to jump into you know a, a couple of them. Uh, th that crunch-based uh, paper that you mentioned that kind of predicted. Yes. Uh, so, what was it? Just numerical or tabulated data, or do you also you, you know read uh, that sort of what included text as well? No, it was only tabular. In fact, oh. uh, the the next extension of that actually is to take it to uh, to tabular, uh, to, to text as well, because a lot of text in crunch space. Uh, I can actually show you something very quickly. I sure. don't know if I have it open. Let me just see if I have it open. Yeah, I do actually. So let me just go in here. So my, my co-authors actually uh, took the model in the paper and built a website <laughs> called Venhound, <laughs> Venture Hound. And oh, yeah. <laughs> you can get COVID scores. You can, so for example, they, we have a, a different, I, the model in the paper is not the COVID scoring model, but we use the same data frame to do this. And so you can actually predict uh, the impact of COVID. So for example, if I go in here and say Amazon, uh, it'll pull up Amazon. And then, so literally it's behind this is a database. We're constantly feeding it from Crunchbase. Mm -hmm. And you go in here, you can see Amazon is positively affected by by the COVID epidemic. Or if you just went in here and did Amazon again, and just looked at main Amazon, not just, you can see they're positively affected by COVID. Now, the obvious one that's badly affected by COVID would be, I guess, United Airlines would be a good candidate for, um, so you go in here, I guess you're negative <laughs> for, for United Airlines. So, so yeah, so there is, so this is all tabular, okay? But we have a lot of features because Crunchbase has many, many things in it. Uh, and uh, I don't know if they're going to maintain it forever because Crunchbase is charging them to kind of pull in the data. You know, I'm not part of this whole website stuff, but what's happened is venture capitalists got an interest in it because it saves a lot of time for them to go through. So there's a Venn score as well, right? Mm. That is actually based on the paper. So, you know, you could put in things over here. <laughs> Is that uh, is that website available to students, or you need to have an account? Or what's yeah, this? it's pretty much free. This they were just doing it for fun, and then you know, then some VCs came along and said, "Hey, can we use this?" You know, but I don't think they're really going to do anything much with it. So, sure. but yeah, you you just go to venhound.com and you can play with it, and then you can actually get an account if you want. It's you know, or okay. something. it's free. <laughs> so. Well, we have, we have a master's degree in alternative investments and, and a course in on venture capital. So I think yeah, it's yeah. kind of fun to show the students. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, so Greg, so Greg, who's the main machine learning engineer for this, Mike Walter, he's just gone to Engine One, which is this activist hedge fund in San Francisco. You might've heard of them with, with you know, taking on Exxon. So, so he's probably not going to spend much time on this anymore, but, but it's, so, you know. No, no, I read somewhere uh, that uh, firms uh, being aware that the text of their data and so on is being used to analyze are basically trying to manipulate the text the way they use it, the, the way they write their whatever right. reports and so on. Right. And that's right. probably more difficult to do with the tabulated data. I mean, is that really true? And is it, is it really possible to fool the, 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 the computer, for lack of a better word, but in your textual data? Or, or is that's too much to ask? No. So the thing is that, uh, uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me just be candid about this. Yeah. If, if the reporting is not regulated, it doesn't matter what modality it's in. You could make up any numbers you like, you know, even in tabular data, right? So so to the extent that text in SEC filings is right, it is regulated. You can't be lying in those SEC filings. Uh, you would hope there is a high level of veracity in that text. Now, now, obviously text allows you lots of degrees of freedom to play around with how you write the same thing. So if you think there's somebody who wrote a scoring algorithm, like I showed you here, take Locker and McDonald and score the text, uh, you could go and look at Locker McDonald's lists and then, you know, change the words you use and, and try and get a higher score if you think some hedge funds are trading on, on, on it and so on. You know, so yes, of course, there are ways to game any kind of algorithm. But if you knew what somebody was doing, you could do that with tabular data to some extent as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, I think, I think the degrees of freedom to do a little bit more manipulation is there. There's this paper called How to Talk When a Machine is Listening. I think yeah. Brian Kelly and some other folks wrote that paper which is sort of alluding to that. The fact is that, you know, when you take large amount of contextual text, uh, it's not that easy. These algorithms pick up on it pretty well. 
And that's why spam filters work really well because it's a Bayesian algorithm. It's constantly updating. And so as long as you have labels that are being attached to these so that you can train. So it's very important that you click on a spam when you see a spam because you're increasing the data set. Because every time the spam guys get around it, the spammers get around it, the, the, the machine learns that these new signatures are also spam if you keep labeling. So it's a, it's, it's a constant game of cat and mouse that will get played, I guess, you know, as the models adapt. Uh, my other question that always kind of sort of fascinated me is that you have in finance, you have certain sort of, uh, I guess, models or areas which are not adversarial, like, you know, credit ratings and so on. I mean, you know, someone's not trying to sort of do the opposite that you're doing. And then you have these adversarial sort of systems like trading, of course, being the main right. one. So what's going to be, in the, you know, look five years down the road or 10 years down the road, uh, What's going to be the source of alpha, if any, left in this adversarial? Is it going to be the programmer? Is it going to be the data provider? Is it going to be Amazon with huge sort of servers? Or I mean, it's not going to be the, tra the traditional trader, of course. Uh, where it's going to come from? So I, I think we're already seeing some of that happening, you know, because the amount of automated trading has actually come down a little bit. But, but by and large, we know well over 50% of the trades are are automatically generated, right? Now, what's gonna actually start happening is uh, we're seeing alpha from different types of data sources, which are static versus streaming. You know, so the, all the HFT guys are basically building really good reinforcement learning uh, tools on top of streaming data. You're eventually gonna see streaming text as well. We already have streaming test, text in newsfeed, it just hasn't got into these algorithms yet. But the moment we get to multimodal, which I'm praying is sort of the, the, you know, sort of forecasting that that's where we're going to go, you're going to see streaming text algorithms as well becoming super important, you know. Uh, and and I have a feeling, yes, to some extent, no human is going to be able to process this data as well, and and uh, the source of alpha will switch from being human generated to to machine generated. I don't think you know this this you can see some of that writing on the wall already. But the ability to sort of discriminate that is, is less. What is of course changed is before when everything was rule-based because algo trading used to be rule-based, the human created the rule. So you would just attribute everything to the human. But now because it's data-driven and the algorithm is learning its own rules, you really do want to ascribe or attribute performance to the algorithm, you know, because I think that's really where it should be attributed. Uh the, the academic papers or academicians are kind of skeptical, that's my take, about these models because we, we mentioned this, they are not interpretable as much uh, you know, as, as a uh, sort of a linear model and so right, on. Right, right. Do, do you see that changing? I mean, you've got PhD students, actually, we have a couple of them here who are working in this area. You see sort of academic journals becoming sort of more receptive to this, uh, to this approach or not? Uh, in fact, this, in, in machine learning, there is a huge, huge uh, effort right now on interpretability, fairness and interpretability, both. And both are crucial things in finance. We know that most of our lending models and a whole bunch of other things tend to be super, super biased, if both on lines of gender, race, age, you know, you can think of all the protected characteristics out there. These models, you know, the current models do have that bias. The bias is in the data because the historical data has, has been there. So we want to sort of mitigate the bias both before in the data before we train a model on it and then mitigate the bias in the predictions. But then you also, part of the mitigation relates to explaining it. So Shapley values, by the way, has become the hot new place, right? To actually go and do this. But there are many other explanatory tools like integrated gradients as well. And so, you know, Facebook, Google, Amazon, all the tech companies have invested a lot in, in, in interpretability. In fact, last year, I was part of the team that built uh, uh, this, which is, oh. okay, so it's actually automating the explanations. And a lot of this came from work only three, four years ago, Scott Lundberg at, uh, so this is the algorithm that actually, so Scott Lundberg actually built Shap, he took Shapley values, which is a game theory concept from 1950s, Lloyd Shapley's work, and adapted it because there it was like, how do you attribute uh, the success in a game of a, in a team to each of the players in the team? Here's the same thing. How do you attribute the prediction quality 
or the prediction of a model to the features. And each of the features is the player in the team. And so if you, this is just open source, you can literally download three lines later, you train a model and then you get the plots and it tells you which of these features was the most important. For each individual observation, it'll tell you which features drove the score that came out of the model higher, which is red and which drove it lower. This confuses me all the time. I don't know why the higher one was made red and the lower one was made blue, but, but it was, you know. Uh, but yeah, so this is this is SHAP and it's literally a few lines of code because you download the open source package and you're up and running. So the moment you train a model, the big advantage of this is, this is a black box interpreter. That is, you literally will call the model, the black box to give you back some numbers and then it'll tell you for that particular loan, let's say, some reasons, you know, it was it was given uh, the loan, loan was denied. What are the reasons the, the credit score was high or the credit score was low? Which features for that loan were different? And then you can add them up across all loans. This is not a loan example, but I'm just you know using that as a template. Yeah. So this is already there, and this has been out since 2017, late actually 2018, I think was when people started using it. <clears throat> and it's it's pretty much standard fare. You don't run a model and don't run SHAP at the end of it on it, you know. So so interpretability is happening. We're currently doing interpretability on text and images. You know, so the, the entire machine learning community is working on images now. So why did yeah. you say that uh, this was, uh, you know, a, a dog versus a cat, you know? Right. And so NVIDIA and a lot of other companies are doing this for automated driving. Why is the car turning left? Which feature is it of the 12 LiDAR cameras? Uh, what feature in, in the images from those 12 LiDAR cameras caused the car to turn left versus right? Was it the sharp edges around the tree or was it the road sign or was it somebody coming out on the road? So those things for every action, you can get what, what were the specific things in that image or what it was seeing that led to the action. So, I, I can see this being used perhaps in, in prediction, you know, maybe in conjecture with some sort of a regime to, to, know, to see in which regime, which features kind of I Correct. That's a, that's a neat idea, actually. Yeah, so yeah. in fact, when I showed you the venture capital paper, I showed you one of the, this, this kind of a plot on the side, right, with all the different features. That was literally out of, out of SHAP. We just uh, used this open source package. Sanjeev, Sanjeev the shapely value has been applied before 2018. And I have papers from 2012. Yes. He was my professor at UCLA. So I've got yeah. several papers where I apply shapely value to finance. I can send them to you. So it's a very useful concept. Um, I mean, you have, a, you have to have a decent sized, um, we all have it, but a decent power on the computer because if you have many uh, right. players, right, the, the calculation, the shapely value and the fair allocation of resources can be uh, onerous. But uh, once you have, so doing this, doing large, solving large problems like 30 years ago or 40 years ago may have been a little bit of a challenge, but nowadays you can do it. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a it's a it's a great framework I and mean, that's why he was such a brilliant guy but uh, yeah it's been used quite a quite a few years before 2018 but some correct i mean you're absolutely right what i was mentioning was that that scott's package shap came out in 2017 2018 yeah, and yeah. that's when you know it kind of things started becoming pretty much productionized around this yeah but what uh, joe is absolutely right this is not cheap computationally to get this picture here is pretty expensive and so there's lots of optimizations done to this to make it work well. So tree models, it works really fast, but the moment you make it a black box model, it's, it's computationally very, very expensive. Well, uh, truly really fascinating. Uh, I couldn't think of a better presentation to wrap up uh, our future of finance. This looks like it, the future of finance. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone else. All the participants uh, made this really remarkable, uh, I think, conference. Uh, and uh, I think our students, faculty, friends, alum uh, benefited from this. So thank you so much. And hopefully we can see you all in person next year this time. Thank you. Have a good thank day. You. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. You guys. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>